The Kalb Report is funded by a grant from the Ethics and Excellence in Journalism Foundation. From the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., this is the Kalb Report with Marvin Kalb. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club and to another edition of the Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb, and our program tonight is a conversation with astronaut Michael Collins. Fifty years ago, the United States sent Apollo 11 to the moon, and for the first time in history, human beings stepped on the moon, leaving a footprint and a flag as proof. It was a stunning achievement. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. hard. T minus 60 seconds and counting, we are go for Apollo 7 at this time. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on 5, 4, 3, 2. Listen, uh... Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Our guest tonight, General Michael Collins, was the command module pilot on Apollo 11. He was actually up there. His two colleagues were Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Their job was simply to walk on the moon. And while they did, Collins had to sort of take care and circle the moon, even the dark side of the moon where no communication with Earth was possible, and prepare the module to recover his two colleagues, and then for all of them to return to the Earth safely. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. <laughs> Three years earlier, in 1966, Collins was in space on Gemini 10, where twice, twice he walked in space. I'm told it's something no other human being has ever done. Connected to the spaceship by a 49-foot umbilical cord. I understand he had trouble getting back into the spaceship and had to be helped. Before becoming an astronaut in 1963, Collins, um, can't see here, Collins was an Air Force test pilot. He comes from a family dedicated to military service. His father was an army general. Two of his uncles, a brother and a cousin, also served. General Collins, I'm sure that I speak for everyone here at the National Press Club when I say we are truly honored to have you with us, and by your performance on the Apollo 11 mission. Now, so much has been written and said about Apollo 11, I doubt that there is anything new to add. However, I'm going to put that task on you. Um, I would, yeah, I'd like uh, to answer that uh, well, in three ways. Uh, no general, uh, <laughs> just Mike. And you want me to call old, you Mike? Old, no, old Mike, if you want to be formal. And uh, <laughs> if you want to really get into it, lucky old Mike. Lucky old Mike? Uh, yes, thank you. Well, how about just Mike? Okay. But what I'm interested in is when you think back over these 50 years, what was the one moment or the one word or the phrase or the action that you will never, ever forget? Well, strangely enough, it was uh, not 
uh, the alien object, the moon, which we had approached and were seeing at very close range for the first time, uh, rather it was looking back over our shoulder at planet Earth, which we knew all about uh, for 30 some years, each of us, but at that time it was about the size of your thumbnail. You could get rid of it if you put your thumb in your pocket, but it kept popping back into view and demanding that you pay a bit of attention to it. And the feeling I got from it was uh, the normal things that you might expect, the, uh, the, the glittering uh, sunshine on it, the white of the, uh, of the uh, sky, the clouds, the, the blue of the oceans, a uh, tiny smear of rust that we call continents. <laughs> but underlying all of that, uh, I know not why, but I got a feeling of great fragility. I, I have the feeling I was looking at something very, very fragile. You mean the Earth itself that was the fragile? The Earth itself, a tiny little fragile thing. And uh, You mean in the vastness of in, space? Well, of course, in the, uh, the, the black velvet of space surrounded it for millennial, whatever, whatever that funny distance is from here to there. Uh, but that, that's what I recall uh, most vividly was the, the tiny earth, the fragile, fragile tiny earth that we all enjoy without really thinking about it. Uh, somewhere along the line, uh, I, I think I, I said to Houston, uh, Houston, I've got the world in my window. And I, I really didn't, just didn't mean that alone, but I, I was seeing something for the first time. And I think when you think about that and, and look at some of those things, uh, all of us can have the world in our window. We can all look at the world in a slightly different way, a more benign, a more benevolent, a more cooperative uh, way. But you have to kind of start the process with, that's my world in that window there. It's my world. Well, when you were thinking first about being a, an astronaut, was it? Buck Rogers that was in your mind, or John Glenn? No, no, Buck Rogers and I, we, uh, we explored the caverns of Mongo. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, when, uh, when John Glenn was just in uh, Knickers, uh, and uh, we did it very successfully, and I just could have took off from there after that. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, in preparing for this interview, I did a lot of reading about you and one of the things they came upon was an interview that you did about 10 years ago in which you admitted to feeling what you called a secret terror, that you would have to leave your colleagues on the moon and return to Earth without them, and that forever after, as you yourself put it, you would be a marked man. And I'm trying to think, for me, the idea of you as a marked man, I don't accept. But why was there this secret terror? Well, because the, uh, the flight to and from the uh, moon is a, is a long and very fragile daisy chain of events. Any, any one link in that chain breaks and everything uh, downstream from that is uh, useless. And uh, <coughs> I, was, uh, I was really not too much worried about Neil and Buzz going down. I thought Neil uh, knew how to fly that machine extraordinarily well. He was going to find a safe landing spot, flat enough. And that machine being the eagle in which they, a, they yeah, left your so, capsule yeah, I'm, and I'm went down in, a, in the eagle. I'm, I'm in a 60-mile orbit, uh, and they, the two of them are descending. Um, we were great believers in redundancy. We liked two or three of every little mechanical component that was important to us. However, the uh, ascent engine of the lunar module, Columbia, uh, was my vehicle. I was up above. Eagle was the one on the surface. So the Eagle just had one ascent engine, one little engine bell, one little uh, ignition source, and uh, and, and that worried me. Uh, that was such an obvious, uh, fragile link in this daisy chain. And if, if, if they couldn't get off, they were dead. And uh, yes, I was coming home. Uh, so it was a worry, something to keep you awake at night. Yes, yeah, so I would imagine. So by the way, did you ever sleep when you were up there circling the, the moon? Whenever possible. 
We don't know. It was kind of noisy, you know. Mission control was yakking all the time, and uh, any time I had like behind the moon was uh, was kind of a blessed period. I sort of enjoyed it back there. Yeah. Was the was the module itself quiet, or is it a shaking instrument? Well, two different things. It didn't shake. Uh, shook a little bit. Depends on the circumstances, the phase of the trip, but. Uh, Quiet, yes it was. It was uh, uh, machinery that you're accustomed to here, but it was pretty much muted, you know, pumps and valves opening and closing and that kind of stuff. No, nothing abnormal, though. I mean, uh, pretty much what you'd expect in the cockpit of an airplane. Armstrong once described the chances of the success of Apollo 11 as no more than 50-50. Is that an odds that you would think pretty much accurate? I, I guess so. I've, I've given that some thought. I, I think it depends on exactly how you define the, uh, the success. I thought that if our chances, which this being the first time we'd really did, tried to do this kind of thing, that our chances of bringing it off in each tiny little detail, successful landing, gathering of lunar samples, rendezvous, returning, I came up with about the same number, 50-50. Now, the chances of saving our, our, our necks are uh, much, much higher than that, and I knew somehow I never wanted to put numbers on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Charles Lindbergh, who was known for many things, not all of them good, did know how to fly. And he said that what you experienced flying on the backside of the moon cut off from communications with Houston and Earth was, in his words, to experience a loneliness unknown to man. But you have said that you weren't lonely at all. And in your words, you said you felt anticipation, satisfaction, confidence, almost exultation. Tell us about that. Well, uh, to begin with Lindbergh, I, I, I think his flight and the flight of Apollo 11 were different in many, many ways. His was much tougher in many ways. He was all by himself. He had no one to talk to to help him out, to uh, help him with his route. Was he left or right or north or south? Uh, uh, he couldn't go to sleep. He was by himself. He could not sleep. He was crash into the ocean. Uh, it was, uh, he had bad weather all along his path. He had a really tough uh, time, much tougher than we had. We were, uh, we were catered to by a huge team of experts on the ground who gave us assistance here and there. Uh, the three of us were uh, trained uh, highly, uh, more so than Lindbergh had a chance to really train. And just in general, we were, we were more of a, of a, of a precise uh, enterprise doing the things that we had been trained to do, as opposed to this really unknown unknown of Charles Lindbergh's. Were you at any time frightened when you were in space? No, I can't say at any time I was. Uh, uh, you know, a fright is a strange thing. Uh, to me, what is really frightening is you're driving down the highway, probably, <laughs> unfortunately, well over the speed limit, comes somebody the other way, and they're, all of a sudden they're in your lane. Oh, man. <gasps> uh, not so in any experience I had in a spacecraft. Uh, what you have instead of fear, you have worry. It's a worry from takeoff to landing. It's a, as I said, it's a fragile daisy chain, and each link that remains unbroken, you, you can't really pat yourself on the back for it because you've got that next one coming up. So you can never really relax and say, look, all the stuff that's gone so well, uh, you go, uh-uh, 41 seconds to go, I've got to turn the ignition on, the damn thing had better work. And there's always something in front of you that makes you worry, so. Is there any one that is more crucial than another, or is it literally one connected to the other? Uh, well, um, as, as I keep calling it a daisy chain. That's maybe not a good analogy, but it gets the idea across. Now, some of the links in the chain were not fatal links. Uh, some were just, they broke things uh, downstream, but you could still, for example, instead of landing on the moon, you could go right around the edge of the moon and, and still survive. But uh, uh, you know, there were plenty of, 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 of hazardous things along the way. But I'm asking because you did have trouble getting back into Gemini 10. 
Uh, what I read was that you were off there floating around, walking around in space. And then when you had to get back and you had trouble getting back, what was the trouble? Well, uh, we had a whole series of, tr of troubles on, on, on Gemini 10, but none of them uh, too, too life-threatening. Uh, uh, Wait a minute, you were floating around in space. Well, yeah, we had... Uh, <laughs> More than, no, not floating around, going uh, ass over tea kettle in space, uh, uh, attached to a 50-foot tether that was swinging out on, on the end of a, a, of a circular path, which was hopefully going to take me around over this Agena, which I hope not to get ensnarled with back to the Gemini so I could get in the cockpit to summarize that. Uh -huh. <laughs> but did, did your co-pilot have to sort of drag you in? No, no, no. John no. Young was flying formation. Uh, he was down here, and, and uh, my problem was uh, uh, we, we were simply had not designed the, our target vehicle, vehicle, the Agena, to be grabbed. Uh, it was not intended to that. It was just an auxiliary rocket, and uh, yet they had put an experiment package on the side of it, and my job was to go up there and remove the package, and every time I, I touched the damn thing, I'd go slithering off somewhere. Uh, it was just poor design, uh, on our, poor thinking on our part in the months prior to launch. So was we, there anything? We had a lot of handholds. From then on, they had handholds everywhere you wanted to go. But when you were floating in space, yeah. You had specific assignments, right? I mean, the, you know? the 49 foot umbilical cord would stretch out 49 feet, but did you have something to do at the 49 foot? Yeah, uh, I, I had something to do at, I don't know if it was 27 feet or, or, or 63 feet, but it was, there is this Agena, John Young is flying the Gemini up to the side of it a variable distance. You just can't keep a precise 49-foot distance away. You can't measure your 49-foot distance. So I had to leave the cockpit of the Gina, push off, go over to the end of it, and then work my way down the side of it and to grab this experiment package. And that's when I slipped and fell and went ass over tea kettle and around and back and over and under. Then a second time, I was able to actually grab the uh, experiment package and return it safely to the cockpit. So. It ended up being, no, you know, not a big deal. No, no, no. <laughs> well, all not right, all. a medium-sized deal then, all right? <laughs> you once wrote <coughs> that you hoped, and this is a quote, that the political leaders of the world could see their planet from a distance of 100,000 miles. And you added, their outlook could be fundamentally changed. Now, I would love for some of our political leaders right now to be 100,000 miles. <laughs> Oh, in space. Fancy that. But, I'm, but, I think, oh, oh, wait. No, I can't. No. But even if this were possible uh, and the political leaders were capable of looking down, how do you think they would change? What, why would they change? Well, in the first place, uh, you have that, uh, that border between Uruguay and Ecuador. Is there such a border? You have this border uh, that's vital, uh, vitally important to both sides. You can't see it. You can't even find that border. That kind of changes your perspective a little bit. Uh, you, uh, you know, if the sun shines on one side, it doesn't the other. No one can control that. Uh, uh, there are a few things that we can, uh, can control here on Earth, but most of them are, are, are beyond our human capability to change. And, uh, when you get far enough away from the Earth, you discover there are fewer and fewer of those things that we can change using our present system of trying to change things. And that if you want to do anything about this tiny little fragile object, you're going to have to, first of all, amend your own thinking about it. Thank you very much for that. Um, Apollo, oh. thank you. Apollo 11, uh, those of us of a certain age who can remember these things, happened in the middle of the Cold War. The Russians had just shot a small, bleeping, unmanned vehicle called Sputnik at the tail end of 1957 into space. And for a moment, it seemed to a lot of people that the Russians were way ahead of us in space. And you were, at that time, right in the middle of your training to be an astronaut. And I'm wondering if 
you were conscious of the superpower competition that you felt yourself an important part of it? Uh, yes, I think uh, at that time, nearly all of, of us astronauts were uh, military officers. We were quite well aware of uh, the antipathy between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, we were not, uh, you know, and on the top secret circuit to find out day by day or week by week what they were doing over there, but we knew uh, they had a, a very uh, powerful background in, in, from the point of view of space history. I mean, we had Robert Goddard, uh, they had Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, the two were about equivalent, uh, you might say. So we knew the, the Russians were our, our competitors, but in our day-to-day -day life and uh, get up in the morning and go to work, uh, we had enough on our plate not to have to worry about what was on the Russians' plate at that time. So, yes, we knew they were there, we worried about them, but it was really, uh, it was like looking at them through a scrim, you might say, or some sort of a filter. It was kind of interesting, as you probably remember, Walter Cronkite at CBS used to do yes. a lot of the space stuff, and he was deeply involved in it, cared about it a lot. I was at that time the Moscow correspondent for CBS. We cared so much at CBS about putting it in a global context that they would fly me from Moscow to Cape Canaveral to add what I thought was the Russian component, where are the Russians in space as compared to us. Did you have a feeling of being behind that you felt you had to catch up? Uh, I, I, that, that's a very good question, and I, I, I don't have a good answer. I, I think there were times when we felt uh, about even Stephen. Sometimes maybe we were behind. Uh, toward the latter years, we I had the feeling we were surging ahead of them. But the uh, latter years being well, well the latter years. Uh, I, I I guess I would call uh, year zero being 1969, the uh, the year of the first lunar landing. But I'd say going back to maybe. 66, we started maybe feeling a little bit better about ourselves, 67, 68, and then into 69. Earlier on, I think it was a less optimistic, a more pessimistic view when we looked across the ocean at the Soviet Union. Did you feel at that time that you were getting enough support from Congress and the American people? Was the political world of America providing you not only with rhetoric, but with the money to do it? Uh, another, uh, another good question, and uh, I, I, I would answer it, uh, and, and not so much in terms of political systems as political leaders, more specifically John F. Kennedy. Uh, as we saw here on, on your preview, uh, John F. Kennedy said that we're going to put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth by the end of the decade. A masterpiece of simplicity, that statement. I don't think you could get a politician today to utter a statement uh, unless he used 10 times as many words. Uh, and it, this masterpiece of simplicity gave us our marching orders. It told us what to do, when to do it. And it was up to the how to do it was up to us. And that's what we spent days working very diligently at. But uh, as, as we went through, uh, we used uh, Kennedy. Hey, you guys got to get more on the ball. You know what he said? We got the time's running out. Get with it. We, we're going to be late for this. We can't do that. We, you're, you're falling behind in this part of it. So it was a wonderful, a wonderful uh, mandate that we had from the president. And I, I think it was probably more than any one single factor what allowed us to land in 69 and ahead of the Soviets or anyone else. Did, did you feel at that time <clears throat> that America's technology was absolutely top of the line stuff? I, I don't know. I, I don't have a feeling that I was uh, well qualified enough to evaluate mm -hmm. our technology at that time. Uh, I'm more of a stick and rudder fighter pilot than a, a technology evaluator. Uh, I think we, are, we were on the right track. Uh, and, uh, and we did have terrible mistakes. Uh, paramount was the uh, fire aboard Apollo 1 that killed uh, 
Gus Grissom mm -hmm. and Ed White and Roger Chaffee. And, and that was the culmination of, of, of a lot of stupidities. And so if you can be stupid uh, one day, uh, you know, six months later, you're maybe smarter, but maybe not that much smarter. So you, yeah, 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 you think you've got a good thing going and you think your technology is, is there to serve you, but then you always have that lingering doubt in the, in the background. Let me, let me take a moment now simply to identify ourselves for our local, national, and international audiences. This is the Kalb Report. I'm Marvin Kalb, and I'm talking with astronaut Michael Collins on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission to the moon. General Collins, or Mike, right? Oh, Mike. Mike, right? oh, Mike. Welcome back. You have written that we as a nation like, quote, exploring, expanding, pushing back the frontier, and in a small but significant way, space has defined our character. You then ask three, I think, very simple but terribly important questions years ago that I think many of us are asking these days as well. And those three questions were, what kind of country are we? What do we stand for? What do we want to be in the next century, that being the 21st century now? So I would like to ask you these questions in a more modern day context and ask your judgment. What kind of a country are we today? And what is it that we stand for now? Well, I think exploration uh, is, a, is a large part of who we have been, who we are, and who we will be in the future. I can't say that it's an overriding component of our civilization, but uh, I personally, uh, I, I, I don't, I, I like, you know, go out, lie down in the middle of a dark night and look up there. Uh, I, I'm attracted to that, I'm mesmerized <coughs> by it. Uh, I, I don't know what I'm looking at half the time, but I know that I don't want to live with a lid over my head. I, I'd, I'd like to uh, think that uh, we uh, have been explorers all our civilization so far and that we will continue to explore, you know, across uh, the land on the East Coast, go across the mountains, the desert, finally we, uh, the Wright brothers, uh, um, one, one advance uh, in aviation and space after the other. I'd like to see that continue. I, I, I think uh, it's, it's something within us. Not everyone, uh, some, some tribes have been uh, very happy to live peacefully in their own secluded valley and never go beyond its borders. But that's very rare. I think people in general, they want to go, to see, to touch, to smell, to understand wherever that may be, on the surface of the planet, a little bit above it, way above it, to the moon, beyond the moon, to Mars, whatever. I think it's somehow within us to have this, it's not a need, but this will, this desire to explore. I want to take you beyond the exploration, um, which you very eloquently uh, discussed, and ask you, in terms of those original questions, they really struck me. What kind of country are we and what is it that we stand for? Do you believe that now, as compared to 50 years ago when Apollo 11 went up, that the same uh, political principles, the same ethical standards govern our lives as a nation now as did then? I guess that's about as clear as I can make it. So you're asking a, 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 an old guy, an old geezer who uh, oh, no, no, uh, no. Uh, went somewhere strange 50 years ago <laughs> to analyze uh, today by political parties and uh, so forth. Are you out of your mind? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, no, I, I think these are extraordinarily interesting times politically, and I think we're doing all right. The, 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 the noise out there is incredible. The, you know, the, uh, uh, everyone uh, is, 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 seems like is of a, uh, of a, uh, not an opinion, but a strong opinion. And the further out you can get with left or right, uh, with those opinions, uh, uh, the more, uh, the louder the voices seem to be, to become. So 
I, I think this uh, dissidence that's going on in the country today is uh, up to a point it's good, beyond that point it's, it's, I believe it's harmful. But who's to decide what that dividing line is? I, uh, far be it from me to, to say that. I, I say the political situation today is, is more confusing to me than it's ever been. Uh, I, can, I can locate uh, someone who believes uh, in something a little bit left or a little bit right or I can find you maybe a half dozen nutballs who are way over here, down there, and all around. And when you put them all together and stir the pot, what do you end up with? I think it's a pretty healthy situation. It's not comfortable sometimes. It's uncomfortable now in many ways, but I think it's probably, on balance, healthy. May I ask you a political question? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I, I have to. Um, is President Trump responsible for any of this? Uh, in your judgment, what, what, what is the role of the president in this? Uh, we could go on to other things. I don't mean to jump on that. You want to go uh, back to space? Uh, I'm sorry, what's that? We can go back to space. Uh, well, no, let me, let me think about it. Uh, I, I, I'm not here to defend or to assault Trump. I have very strong feelings about it, but I don't know that they're uh, particularly, uh, uh, particularly helpful. Uh, I, I will touch on, uh, on one, one tiny aspect of it. I will say that... Um, The, uh, I, I, I'm glad to have this invitation to come here to this building, to this organization. The National which, Press Club. Uh, because it's the, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, but it's the, uh, the headquarters of the enemy. Well, wait a minute. Right? The enemy, the enemy is a phrase that the well, president right, used. It, it, right, we don't. It, it is a, it, it, maybe, Maybe I, I, I misunderstood, but uh, I, aren't the sir, are you the enemy? Uh, uh, madam, we don't think of ourselves madam, as that. The enemy? We don't think of ourselves as that. The enemy, my ass. <laughs> the, the, the press is not our enemy. The press is our salvation. And I thank you for it. Uh, 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 uh. Let's go back to space. <laughs> um, okay, do you think that we are in a race with Russia for the control of space? Uh, I, I think the uh, Russian leadership, uh, Putin, uh, will probably do what, whatever he can do to make uh, the Soviet Union, or whatever it's called today, Russia, uh, um, uh, more important. And if he includes some space trips in that, uh, I, I think he will espouse them. I, I don't think that's his primary uh, bent. I think the Chinese uh, tend to be a little more space-oriented today than does, the, uh, does Russia or perhaps the United States. Uh, not quite sure about that. But uh, uh, so I, I, if, if, you, if you're looking for competition, uh, I, I'd worry a little bit more about the Chinese than I would the Russians. Explain to us, uh, recently the Chinese landed a vehicle on the far side, the dark side of the moon. Yes. Could you explain to us why is that important? Well, the fact that uh, they landed uh, on the back side of the moon 50 years after we landed on the front side of the moon, I don't think that's any big deal at all. Uh, uh, it's a minor achievement. However, uh, the future uh, of, uh, of that achievement may bear all kinds of uh, fruit. Uh, uh, not fruits, wrong term, but ore. There's uh, the rare metals uh, on, on, in, on some of those rocks. There's uh, there gold, uh, there, there's platinum, there's things that we consider of, of, of great uh, economic value. And if they can uh, expand their base there and get into the mining operation there and figure out how to then 
uh, not only uh, uh, get those or refine them a little bit on the moon and somehow ship them back to Earth, then th they're going to have something that will be very valuable. How long that will take to ensue, I do not know. But uh, are there all of these minerals only on the dark side and not on the side that we landed on? I, uh, you have to ask Jack Schmidt now. He's the guy, the, the, the geologist, PhD from, from um, MIT or, or Harvard. He was from Harvard, and he knows about each rock. But uh, from what I recall of my geology training, the maria, the flat areas on the front side of the moon, that's where they are predominantly, are, are pretty much sandy barrens, whereas on the back side of the moon you have much uh, much. Um, uh, much rougher terrain and nooks and crannies and cracks and, and fissures and, uh, and the, the uh, chemistry of that surface material on the back side of the moon is of much greater interest financially and, and just intellectually than the maria on the front side. Why didn't we get to the back side? Why didn't we, uh, I'm sorry? Why didn't we get to the backside of the moon before the Chinese? Oh, uh, since we had been in the front side so much ahead of them. Well, I, I guess because our, our leadership, uh, for right or wrong, didn't just, didn't think it was worth uh, worth the money. And uh, you know, if I were voting uh, with them, I'd say so far our leadership, uh, Democrats, Republicans, whatever, nutballs, whatever. Uh, uh, I don't think that's a, a bad decision. Uh, uh, if, if we knew maybe more about uh, how to build larger uh, rockets, and, and people like uh, Jeff Bezos and uh, Elon Musk are, are helping us a little bit in that way, it could be that we could get to the backside of the moon and, and have a soft landing with a big enough machinery that was going to machine that was going to go around and, and, and excavate and bring back uh, somehow all these wonderful ores. But uh, th th that's something I think that is beyond the realm of possibility for another, I know not a decade or perhaps more. Um, are we? sort of farming out the spacecraft industry to the private sector now? Is that what is happening with the American space program? Well, I, I think uh, Musk and Bezos have, have discovered ways to do uh, things cheaper and uh, quicker than the federal government has. And I think the federal government should say, hey, you may want to throw their money in, into the kitty. Wonderful. I mean, I'm not, why would you possibly say no to it? Whether the money is federally appropriated or comes out of their pocketbooks, what I care about is the hardware that it produces and not necessarily the source of the funds. And the, the more, hardware the, the, more the merrier, I would say. Well, but you're suggesting that the hardware from priv the private sector is better, um, comes along more quickly, than government hardware? In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. I oh. mean, for example, uh, uh, the, the Bezos uh, has, has pioneered in the idea of shooting a rocket off. Uh, it gets rid of its payload, and then instead of crashing into the ocean, it returns to its launch pad and is reused. Uh, so that is a tremendous cost saving. And, and maybe the feds could have uh, done that uh, as well, but they didn't. They, they were off doing something or other else, and he decided that was a, a very profitable avenue and something of value. Uh, uh, again, whether that rocket, that reusable rocket, whether it's launched by uh, a federal appropriation or, or out of Musk's pockets, uh, really doesn't matter. We had, I think the U.S. government had a program according to which by 2028, uh, we would be sending astronauts back to the moon. Um, that, according to the Trump administration, has now been dropped down to 2024. And NASA has said that that is an achievable date, that we ought to be able to do that. Do you agree? No. Uh, well, I mean, do you agree with what? Uh, that we do you go agree back to, that, that we, we can go back to the moon? No, that we can do it at 2024, five years from now. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Probably not. I mean, we're usually optimistic in our estimates, uh, so it'll probably take longer than that. Uh, I, it, I, I think it depends on go back to the moon and do what? Go back to the moon and why? 
uh, go, go back, back to, to the moon as opposed to going to Mars. Exactly. And I was going to say that part of the plan is that you, uh, by 2024, astronauts return to the moon. They set up shop so that it becomes a refueling stop for the ascent then to Mars. Um, number one, just theoretically, that makes sense, right? That's the way to do it. Or you have also talked about going directly from Earth to Mars on a large elliptical loop. Which, well, which is better? Well, what you're talking about, is, uh, to change the vocabulary a little bit, is uh, the plan now, I think is NASA's official uh, plan, is to, uh, is to go to the, uh, Earth, uh, back to the moon and, and you create a, a pathway, which is a, a, a very elongated uh, elliptical sort of a orbit pointed out toward Mars, and that you use, um, uh, you, you have a build-up approach. You have a relay uh, vessels working in and out of that pathway, and they're refueling here, and they're being resuscitated on, on from the moon. Of, um, uh, refueling there in the pa in the lunar end of the pathway, and resuscitated with more supplies from Earth. And uh, I, I, um, I, I, say, uh, I say no. Uh, oh, no. I, there are a lot of caveats in my no. The biggest one is uh, Neil Armstrong. He died before the, all these details were put together. But in the conversations I had with him, he did feel that perhaps there were so many unknowns about going from Earth direct to Mars that it made sense to fill in some of these gaps in our knowledge around the moon before you went. Uh, I, uh, he, Neil's a lot better engineer than I am, I guarantee you that. Uh, so that's, that's certainly a, a, a credible approach, and that seems to be the one that is most popular today. I say no, I go with uh, John F. Kennedy, and I would take the, 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 the JFK direct, not the pathway direct. I think if you want to go to Mars, you decide to put your chips in there and, and develop the hardware and go and do it. Now, it's not simple. It makes, uh, you know, the, it, it's, a, it's about a two-year voyage and... Uh, Wait a minute, a two-year to do what? It, uh, to go from uh, the surface of the Earth uh, to Mars with a, a spacecraft and, and return that crew to Earth. Uh, it this, would take two years. It's about two years. Uh, now, Apollo 11 took eight days. Eight days. You know, eight, so Apollo is a uh, uh, child's play compared to uh, going right. to Mars. And if you were to use Mars as a launching pad in a way, uh, yeah. refueling stop, the astronauts on Mars need oxygen. How do you provide that, and isn't there a constant threat of radiation poison? Well, they have all kinds of problems. So the, the people who, are, who go to Mars, uh, I, I mean, uh, you know, if you count the planets out from the sun, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, there's Earth, Mars, they're side by side, they're twins, if you will, are the closest thing that we have to a sister planet, but nonetheless, they're couple hundred million miles um, um, separated uh, and, uh, and and they are in uh, different sorts of orbits around the uh, around the sun uh, you, you, the, the the path that is the cheapest in terms of fuel expenditure is called a home and transfer a home and transfer takes about nine months one way Unfortunately, when you get there, you can't turn around and come home because in the meantime, the planets have rearranged their orientation. You may have to wait for a year or so on the surface before they're in proper alignment that you can come home. On the surface of what? Of Mars. You go, you land on Mars, you try to get home. The round, the total trip, I'm saying, first time out, it is going to be a voyage around uh, <coughs> I, excuse me, uh, it, it, it's going to be a, a voyage of around two years. And, um, and, and two years is, a, is an eternity when it comes to aircraft or spacecraft malfunctions. Uh, you have to be uh, uh, independent of anybody like mission control. Uh, you, you can't have any uh, crew compatibility problems. Uh, you can't have illnesses, really, or fatal illnesses. Uh, 
you, uh, you, you, you're the subject to a great deal of, or, of uh, radiation, uh, solar radiation, extraplanetary radiation, and so there's a host of problems uh, facing anybody who wants to go to Mars. It's just uh, going to be very, very difficult. And what kind of time frame are we talking about if it even worked perfectly? The daisy chain was operated perfectly. Well, I don't know. I've, I've thought about this, uh, you know, JFK direct approach and say to land, uh, to land a crew of men and women on Mars by uh, so-and-so and, and return them safely to Earth. And the so-and-so I'd put in there would be about 2040, something like that. that 2040, year, that another year. 20 years out. Yeah, I, that would be about what I'd guess, but... Uh, you got a lot of people guessing who are a lot better at that stuff than I am. So I, I do not know, but uh, that'd be my guess. In your judgment, is the moon habitable? The moon? Sure, the moon is habitable, but you have to bring your own oxygen with you and a few things like that. It depends on how you define habitable. I'm not sure. Sometimes my house, I think, is not habitable. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure. Uh, about the moon, but yeah, by and large, it can, can be made habitable. You touched on what I'm about to ask you before, but I want to kind of nail it down. Uh, Vice President Pence has been put in charge essentially of the space program for this administration, and he used very dramatic, bold language in a recent speech. He said, the United States must remain first in space in this century as in the last, he then went on, the rules and values of space will be written by those who have the courage to get there first and the commitment to stay. You implied earlier uh, in our conversation that we were for a time first last century, the 20th century, but not all the time. Would you say that in the 20th century, we were first for most of that period of time? For most of it? Yes, no, what do you think? Oh, yeah, but I thought that, that was part of the question. You were going to go on and finish that question. No, but I, what I'm trying to get at is, one, is the vice president right when he said that we were first in the last century and in this? And I ask the question because there's a space station out there now that is a Russian space station. We use it. We have people who go up there. So it doesn't seem as if we're number one. It seems as if we're renting out space from the guy who is number one. So the idea that we are first doesn't make any sense. Am I right? I don't know. Um... I'm going to dodge the question. I'm going to answer one that's first that's cousin right. to that's it. That's all right. That's happened before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to answer one that's first cousin to it. Uh, <clears throat> I was a military officer. We landed Apollo 11 on the moon. We had an American flag. We saluted. I was extremely proud of that. Extremely. I thought that was just a wonderful manifestation, sure uh, not only of, uh, of a president like John F. Kennedy, but of a technological base, uh, industrial base that could do that. I mean, Ed, I, I, I just have a, an encyclopedia of things that I thought was wonderful about that. It made me more and more patriotic to be um, a, a, a citizen of the United States of America. About uh, a few months after that, uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and I were very lucky. We were sent around the uh, set around the sent around the uh, Earth, and we visited uh, 27 cities. Not not all of them capital cities, uh, but most of them big, large cities. And and I was really amazed by the reception that we received, and it was a unanimous reception. No no naysayers. Instead of saying, well, you Americans finally did it, it did it, you, didn't you? You landed on the moon. They all said, we did it. We did it. And uh, Humankind, I just couldn't, everybody. yeah, we human beings, we left, uh, we left our home planet and we went elsewhere. Uh, and, uh, and, and Neil Armstrong 
was a master at, uh, in, in that environment. He, had, he was a very intelligent man. He'd done a tremendous amount of homework. Uh, he, had, he had hobbies and knowledge far beyond the NASA space program. Uh, he was a historian, historian of science primarily. Uh, Neil had a way, no matter where he went, of talking to the locals in their terms, reflecting some of their situations, their problems, and almost just welcoming them. You could feel them. They almost say they came into the door of, of, <laughs> of, of, of Columbia and wanted to fly with us to the moon. He was just a master of that. But OK, ding, ding, there's the American flag on the moon. I salute it. Uh, there's the whole world saying to us, we did it. We humanity. So where do you put your values? OK, what, okay Marvin, what do you say? I'm all for it. Huh? Fair I wish is fair. I, Come on. I wish I were with you. Fair is fair. I wish I were with you. You what? I wish that I were with you. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. But I'd probably screw it up, so it's just as well that I wasn't. Okay. Um, you once described your life as 10% planning and 90% potluck. Yeah. Is that about right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe uh, m more luck than 90%. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I, uh, I, I have a strange background. I, uh, uh, I, I went, to, you know, with all my Army uh, background, my, uh, my uncle being chief of staff and everything, my brother is a general, my uh, uh, dad was a general. When they weren't looking, I snuck off into the Air Force <laughs> And, and learned how to uh, fly an airplane, and, and I became a fighter pilot. And then um, when NASA was first looking for astronauts, I was uh, stationed over in, in France. And over there, we used to uh, get all the uh, Air Force uh, uh, fighter wings. They put the, they'd, have a, a t they'd assemble a team, and each one of them would send a team down to uh, Tripoli, Wheelis Field in Tripoli, Libya. And, um, and we would practice dropping atom bombs on the Russians, and uh, we would have competitions. Say, say that again. We would practice uh, dropping atom bombs, you know, the big boom boom. Uh, yeah. How did you practice that? Well, we practiced with what we called uh, shapes. They were, uh, they were a thing attached under one wing, and they were the, the length and diameter of a real atom bomb, but they were phonies, but they had make-believe. Yeah, glad to hear that. Yeah, thanks. Aren't you? I, I know you would. <laughs> the interior of them was wired so that you would, in the cockpit, you would go through your, your routine of, of how you armed them and di disarmed them and, and, and so on. But the point I'm making, uh, uh, once a year they'd have a big competition down there, and uh, they had two different ways of uh, dropping these bombs. Uh, one was called toss bombing. If I want to drop them on you, I go balump. And um, the other one is over the shoulder. If I want to drop on you, I go past you, and then boom. And anyway, I won one of the two uh, trophies that year, 1956. And I think that was the only reason I, I got into uh, the test pilot school. My, my bosses were really very happy, and they wrote flowery letters and blah, blah. <laughs> but the point I'm coming at, that's damn luck, you know? Uh, I mean, that's, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 still wake up, I still wake up at night, and I wonder, what the hell went wrong with the second one? You know, I did everything perfectly, and it somehow went off to the side. And I, 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 to this day, it bothers me. I don't know how it did, but it did. But anyway, luck, I'm yeah. glad that you then became a test pilot. That's very yeah, good. Then, yeah, then, I, then that, that got me into pilot. test pilot school, and one thing led to another. But... but uh, um, just a little bit of mathematics. Um, I looked it up, and you are, you were born in 1930. Yes. And I was born in 1930. And Neil Armstrong was born in 1930. 30. And Buzz, and Buzz Aldrin was born in 1930. Yes. But uh, that makes you 88 years old. Jesus, that bad? <laughs> and so if I was born in 1930, I am also 88 years old. Now. Do you think we could make a deal right now that when we reach our 90th birthday, 
you will come back and be my guest on another Cal report. Is that a deal? Yeah, it sounds like a good deal to me. Yeah, the, uh, Let's shake it up. I mean, they. <laughs> hey. Thank you. Well, let me just tell you that. <laughs> I mean, I could go on with this guy forever, but I'm not. We'll wait until we're both 90. Uh, the time, the tyranny of the clock, as they call it. And I want first to thank our audience here at the National Press Club for their very kind attention. But most of all, I want to thank Michael Collins. Thank you. For taking the time to be with us. Well, for sharing you. his insights and his thoughts about that great moment in American and global history, the idea that people could think about going to the moon, and we did it. You were up there, and we landed people on the moon. It was a great accomplishment, and we are all incredibly proud that you are here as our guest. Well, thank you. It's a but wonderful That audience. is it for now. Thank you. I'm Martin Kalb, and as Ed Murrow used to say many, many years ago, good night and good luck. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> that was really wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've got to go to a microphone. And I am under the impression that there are some students who are going to ask questions. And I will turn right here. Could you please ask? Identify yourself, tell us where you are, and then ask a question. Hi, uh, my name is Anna Bowman. Um, I'm a journalism student at the University of Oklahoma. Um, Mr. Collins, I was just wondering, um, with your exploration of space, um, how do you think that helps humanity's um, understanding of the universe? I'm sorry, how would it change? How would, it, how would your exploration of space end up helping humanity? Well, one of the things that, um, that, that I think may help is, um, is, is once upon a time I was flying around in space somewhere and I looked down and I said, uh, hey, Houston, I got the, uh, the world in my window. <laughs> and, and I think if you take that idea and expand it, uh, you can have the world in your window. You know, it's not something that's uh, exclusive to me, or it's not even something that's exclusive to someone in, who has gone into space. But you can consider the world in your window, what you think about that world, how you think it might be changed, what part you might play in changing that world in directions that you think are important for you, for your values. Uh, I, I, I would suggest that to you. Excellent. Yes, please. Uh, you touched on this uh, at the very beginning of the program. Could the, I have uh, your name, please? Um, Michael Swoboda. I'm a fa GDP faculty member, and I'm a <coughs> regular contributor to Yale Climate Connections. Okay. Uh, the Apollo moon missions were a major impetus for the first environmental movement. Uh, do you see any prospects that this four years of uh, 50th anniversaries will galvanize action on climate change? Environmental, that, that environmental? As, we, as we celebrate the yeah. 50th anniversary of the Apollo mission, yes. will that have a positive effect on the environment as well? Could we help move in that direction? I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I think, um, I, I think the, certainly the space program uh, going elsewhere from other than planet Earth uh, has definite environmental implications. Uh, but whether it will become a popular uh, topic of discussion, uh, I, I, you just go nudge somebody in the ribs and say environmental, they don't say space. Uh, hooking the two together is worthwhile uh, attempt, but not easy to do. Okay. Yes, please, right here. Um, I'm Ann Lyko, a member of the press club and a f former officer with USIA and helped uh, program the Apollo 17 astronauts in part of Africa. I remember where I was on, on July 20th, um, 1969. I remember seeing um, people all over the world on the television doing what you had described, seeing this as a triumph for humankind. And I remember in the late 60s, whether you talk about with Antarctica and then ultimately in space about demilitarizing and sharing the development and exploration, 
my question is, as things have been changing where it looks like we're with our new Space Force and with the Chinese and others, that we're beginning to think about militarizing space, um, are we losing the sense that this is something from this fragile little earth in our window where we are all have to protect it um, to still competing in an area where we may be putting it in danger? Thank you. The major point is, is there a risk now that we are militarizing space and then losing so many other opportunities? Yeah, the militar militarization of space is, is such a complex uh, uh, topic field. Uh, the most recent uh, developments have been that the, uh, the, the Russians now have a, uh, this is kind of space related and not really, it's atmospheric, but they launch a, uh, can launch a, uh, a hypervelocity, extremely fast uh, missile that can go up into space a bit, loiter around up there. Then they pick a target, and instead of coming down in a ballistic path that's very predictable to hit their target, my nice glass, uh, they now have one that can uh, jump this way, that way, that way, and the other. And it, it can follow a path and, uh, that deviates from time to time. It'll come down, it'll turn, it'll bank, it'll go up, it'll go down. So how do, you, uh, how do you stop something like that? It knows where it's going. It maybe likes Des Moines for some reason as a target, but uh, instead of, as the old ones, it would have to be programmed all the way in an arc and then you could intercept it along a, a, a known path. This thing follows such an irregular path that it's virtually unstoppable, at least by today's technology. Now, is that the militarization of space? Yeah, I, I guess it is. You could say it's improving artillery if you don't like uh, the militarization of space as a word, but uh, what do you do about something like that? I, I think what we do so far is we have uh, uh, international organizations and we, we, have, uh, we ban uh, the use of uh, atomic weapons under this, that, and the other circumstance. And then we just sort of add this new one to the, uh, ca to the catalog, to the inventory, and we try to figure out how to talk the Russians out of it or how we then counter it with our own uh, crazy interceptor that can figure out how to do it. Terrible problem, this militarization. I, not the militarization of space, I, I wouldn't call it. The militarization of the planet, I would call it more. Yes, please. Hi, my name's Jacqueline Aerosmith. General Collins, I was wondering if you think going to Mars should be our priority, and if so, you know, how we really get there since space, you know, space exploration doesn't seem to be a political priority. No, please ask that question again. I didn't okay. get the beginning of it. I was wondering whether General Collins thinks that going to Mars should be this priority in terms of space exploration. Whether going to Mars should be yeah. the priority. Well, I... I I used to joke that uh, you know when I came back from Apollo 11 that I'd been sent to the wrong place, that uh, uh, NASA really ought to be renamed the National Aeronautics and Mars Administration. And so I've, I've been very, very pro-Mars all my life, and, uh, and, and I still am. I, I think that's the next logical uh, stepping stone as we go out into space, and uh, I'd like to see us pursue a program I'm not sure that it has to be a gung-ho, right now you got to do it in this next fiscal year kind of a program. I, I think it can be a much longer range uh, a goal, but nonetheless a goal that you angle in toward and you, and you use your, uh, a reasonable amount of your um, gross national product uh, to take on um, at the time that we went to the uh, moon, I think uh, the NASA appropriation was a, little, it was a bit over uh, a percent, I think, of GNP, and now it's probably down to less than a half of 1%. And, uh, and, and so we could put some more money into it, but on the other hand, I'm not sure getting there in a hurry is as important as getting there. Excellent point. Yes, please. I'm Chris Gunty, and I was privileged to cover the first shuttle launch as a college journalist. 
In the 12 years between your lunar mission and the first launch of the shuttle, did we, have we made progress at that same pace? And if not, why not? In the 38 years since. Uh, how fast are we uh, going and giving the shuttle to this, that, and the other? No, but how much progress have we made? This well, the shuttle, I think, was a wonderful uh, machine in that it, it could launch vertically uh, like a spacecraft, land horizontally on a runway like an airplane. Beautiful machine. Uh, unfortunately, it, it killed, uh, I think, uh, seven people in one accident and maybe a seven in a second. I'm not sure. So it, uh, it certainly had its defects. Uh, whether we build upon that model, the vertical takeoff, the horizontal airplane landing or not, I, I don't know. So uh, you end up with saying, well, are we, are we going faster or slower or better or worse, abandoning the shuttle and building on the shuttle? I, I don't know. It's a good question. I, I don't know where we go from here on that. Okay. Yes, please. Michael, my name is David Vujic, and I'm a former member of the North American Aviation Program, Apollo Program Management Team. Uh, it was a delight to meet you on numerous occasions in beautiful downtown Downey. Uh, I work for the unsung hero. Excuse me, of you're going to have program, to ask a question because a we've got a lot of people the waiting. Of, a gentleman by the name of Harrison Storms, who I'm sure you know very well. My question to you is the fact that uh, we were grasping for an awful lot of straws back in the 60s uh, with respect to the design characteristics of the command module. We were looking initially at the X 15, the technologies from the XB 70. Also, with respect to the lunar excursion model, there were questions with respect to what Mr. Cal Bask earlier with respect to leaving one of the astronauts on the moon. The question I have for you is, today, do we still have the caliber of uh, scientists, scientists and engineers that developed the integrated circuits, the types of materials that we're using today to include the Gill Roofs, to include people like uh, uh, Maxime Faget, to include people like uh, um, uh, Bolt, Bolton with respect to how can we ga gather another team of individuals to pursue the next uh, level of sophistication in space. Thank you, sir. I guess the, the, the process of attracting people to work for the government um, hinges on money like other things. Um, the people who were, uh, like Max Viget is a good example that you pointed out, the man is a genius of, in his own way. Uh, people like Max and the teams they headed up were, they were young people they were gung-ho, they were, they were paid uh, what today would be considered a pittance, but they worked uh, day and night. Now, they, they did that because they believed in their program, they believed in going to the moon. To get that kind of dedication, particularly among the younger ones coming out of college to go into uh, becoming a, a government GS3 or whatever, uh, that depends on what their, what their goals are, and that's where I think Mars comes into it. I think you can, you can marshal a lot of enthusiasm and organize it with a, uh, an overriding goal of Mars rather than other things like returning to the moon. Okay. Yes, please. Good evening, sir. My name is Linda Strading. I'm an Air Force brat, but I'm also a volunteer docent at the National Cathedral. We have a piece <coughs> of the rock you brought back from the moon in our window. When we talk about your mission of Apollo 11, we often wonder to ourselves if you have any regrets about not being able to walk on the surface of the moon. You went all that way and couldn't dip your toe in the sand. <laughs> Good question. Do you have any regret having traveled so far toward the moon not having actually set foot on the moon. Uh, no, no, I, I get asked a, an awful lot, and I, you know, I'd be a liar or a fool if I said I had the best seat on Apollo 11. I, I clearly did not, but, <laughs> but having said that, I can say with absolute honesty, I was just delighted to be assigned to that uh, crew. Uh, 
I, uh, I, 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 that was, you know, the end of uh, Kennedy's uh, dream. It was, uh, it was an honor to, to be any, any tiny part of that. Actually, I came to the uh, crew of Apollo 11 from uh, the crew of uh, Apollo 8. It was the flight uh, that was the first to leave Earth orbit and, and didn't land on the moon, but it went out and around it. Um, I, 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 I had to... Uh, I, had, I was removed from that crew because I had some uh, neck surgery on my spine. But um, when I, uh, <clears throat> when I uh, got back on flying status, they made me the uh, CAPCOM, the capsule communicator of Apollo 8. And so what that meant was I was doing all the communication from mission control. They could not go to the moon without my permission. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> It was, you know, NASA has to give a fancy name to everything. This was called translunar injection. This is where the Apollo 8 left Earth orbit and zinged off for the first time ever to go beyond escape velocity. And, uh, and, and I thought, oh my God, this is the biggest deal ever. You know, the, the Pope's going to send a message. The president will come down. <laughs> Frank Sinatra will sing. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and of course, Frank Borman, the commander of Apollo 8, and me, the uh, Capcom, we're, we're going to have this dramatic interchange that's going to encapsulate the, uh, the historical magnificence of this thing. So time came, and I went first. Uh, Apollo 8, you go for TLI. Borman, he answered with equal aplomb. Uh, Roger Houston, that was it. You know, here you have, uh, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, this was, the, you know, the, the most uh, remarkable incident in all of human history. And, and uh, we said, uh, you go, and he said, Roger. You know, God, uh. Beautiful. Yes, please, another question. Mike, uh, my name is Lola Otano. You remember a nun? that work with you at the Aerospace Museum. And I want to thank you for the memories. And Nan was very happy. And you are a leader. So thank you again. And take care of yourself. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, please. I'm Miriam Fields from the University of Pennsylvania. I'm a communications student, and I was just curious um, if you could talk about the recent imaging of the black hole and what you think that means for space travel and for technology in the future. I'm not sure I got all of that, did you? I can't, I don't hear a word. Huh? Would you try that? <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering if you could talk about the imaging of the black hole Oh, the and black how hole that, image that, of oh, that they travel. had the other night. <laughs> well, I, yes, that, that's come into, black holes have come into uh, prominence lately. I think it was, was it Time uh, maybe magazine, or one of them had an a, a illustration of a black hole on its cover. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, the amazing thing to me is we have uh, all these gigantic telescopes, computers that you would not believe, uh, all this gear and equipment. Um, Black holes, uh, Albert Einstein figured out with uh, a blackboard and a piece of chalk. <laughs> and uh, what one is, uh, it, it's, it's a, a local region where the pull of gravity intensifies, solidifies, no, solidifies not the right word, but intensifies, comes together and, and creates kind of a funnel into which objects can fall, never to return, the gravitational pull of, of the hole is such, it only sucks things in, and, and then eventually I, it, they disintegrate. Exactly why they do, I don't know. But anyway, it's just, uh, it, it's gravitational, go, uh, gravi gravity gone wild, I guess I would say, or gravity going to infinity, you might say, is a better way of describing a black hole. Amazing, and, and the most amazing of all is Albert Einstein. Jeez, oh. Thank you. Another question here, please. Hi, my name is Sarah Murphy, and I was wondering, do you think Pluto should be a planet? <laughs> do you think Pluto should be a planet? Yeah, what? Pluto should be a planet? Pluto. 
You know, I don't understand that. What do you think? <laughs> uh, you know, it was, I, it, it was for a while, and then it wasn't for a while, and now it is again a while, right? Yeah. What do you think? Well, I did a project on it in fourth grade, and I don't think it should be because it's behind the, another belt. I forgot what the belt's called. But anyway, and it doesn't have the same orbit as every other planet does. It, like, goes around in other planets' orbits, too. Well, that's a good reason. Now, are most people starting to agree with you or disagree with you? Yeah, because I think it's a, because I I think it's a planet more likely. Isn't it, isn't it the people who say it's a planet, aren't they kind of winning? I don't know. <laughs> okay. We've got, time for, we've got time for one more question right here. Lucky old Mike, uh, I'm Andrew Martin. I'm also from the National Cathedral with another question about the moon rock that we have in one of our stained glass windows. Do we have a moon rock in our stained glass window because you were an altar boy at the cathedral while you were a student at St. Albans? <laughs> oh. I know. I, I think if the people who had been in charge of me being an altar boy thought that I had anything to do with that mission, maybe they wouldn't have allowed that window to be put in there. That's what I think. <coughs> no, no. Thank you. Anyway, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful window, though, and it does have an actual moon rock in it. Uh, it's a, a very unusual design because uh, of, of its modernity, I would say. Uh, how do you depict uh, in stained glass uh, something that's a technical advance like that? And they've done a nice job of it. I'll, those of you who uh, haven't been in the cathedral here ought to take a, take a glance at it sometime. You know, when we first met a couple of hours ago, and I uh, was asking you a very simple question, should I call you General Collins no. in the course of the interview, Mr. Collins? And you told me about Mike. Yeah. Uh, and I feel that after this couple of hours, uh, you are definitely Mike. Okay, thank you. And you are in a phenomenal representative and an extraordinary moment in American history. And I think that young people are going to be studying that forever and a day and maybe coming out with some perhaps better ways of organizing our lives. Uh, because as you said yourself, that you did something quite extraordinary, you don't want to dwell on that, but the fact is there are spin-offs, and maybe a lot of those spin-offs can be positive and inspirational, because I think we all need a good bit more of inspiration. So thank you very much for being our guest. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.